Dr. Robert Butler is with us today and joining us from New York City. Uh, and we're just thrilled to have him up and joining us today. He actually, in the minutes I was chatting with him here before uh, we got started, uh, found out that he has a, uh, that he's familiar with Warren County. In fact, he's worked here before. So he has a funny story for us to tell us about uh, his history with Warren County. Uh, Dr. Robert N. Butler is uh, president and CEO of the International Longevity Center USA, and professor of geriatrics and adult development at the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Adult Development of the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. Physician, gerontologist, psychiatrist, public servant, Pulitzer Prize winning author, Dr. Robert Butler has long been involved in a broad array of social and health issues. When I, when I thought about that phrase, has long been involved in, in a broad array of social and health issues. Think about some of the things that, that, that have been accomplished here. In 1968, he coined the term ageism to describe prejudice against elders. In 1975, he became the founding director of the National Institute on Aging, or the National Institutes of Health. In 1976, he won the Pulitzer Prize in the nonfiction category for his book, Why Survive? Being Old in America. In 1982, he founded the first Department of Geriatrics in a U.S. medical school at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, where he now continues to serve as a professor of geriatrics and adult development. In 1990, Dr. Butler established the U.S. branch of the International Longevity Center, or ILC, at the Mount Sinai Medical Center. Today, there are additional affiliated ILC centers in over a dozen countries, all conducting studies of the impact of the unprecedented aging of populations upon society and its inst institutions. In 1995, he was named chair of the advisory committee of the White House Conference on Aging. Throughout his career, he's been an eloquent advocate for the rights and needs of elders, frequent advisor to the World Health Organization, frequent testifier and advisor to US Congress. He's the author of some 300 scientific and medical journal articles, and has written or co-written several books, including his most recent book, The Longevity Revolution, The Benefits and Challenges of Living a Long Life, which everyone should have received a copy of when you came in. And now in keeping with modern technology and today's popular format for public discourse, frequent blogger <laughs> on aging issues on his blog that's aptly titled Ageism in America. I checked that out. Uh, which can be accessed on the International Longevity Center website. So please join me in humbly welcoming uh, Dr. Robert N. Butler. Thank you, Gail, and thank you, Rob, and congratulations on your victory. I think it's just great. I do have strong, wonderful reminiscences of this beautiful Adirondacks. So I'll just quickly tell you a story, but preface, but preface it by pointing out that Mark Twain, the great humorist, said, one of the advantages of old age is you remember things that never happened. <laughs> but this did happen. 1947, that's 62 years ago, a young fellow, pre-med, I'm working at the, Sarah, at the uh, Sagamore Hotel, as a house detective. And that was because they didn't have a job as busboy, which is the job I really wanted, because then I would have really made some money. So as a sop, they gave me this job. And then one night, knowing I was a medical student, the boss said, disappear. I think there's going to be a raid tonight, and we do gambling here. And Governor Tom Dewey is going to come in on us. I don't want to ruin your chance to get into medical school, so disappear. <laughs> so you can see I have some very warm reminiscences about this beautiful area. Well, I know we have a very diverse audience. Is there a thing for me to? Unfortunately, you're, that high tech, it would be me. I just look at you. That'd be a pleasure. That'd be a pleasure. <laughs> well, I know we have a very diverse audience, as you can see. So I'm going to try to give kind of a diverse talk that will pick up on many of the trends, but may not seem quite as coherent as it otherwise might be. So I wrote this book, The Longevity Revolution, as an endeavor to 
try to summarize some 50 years of my thinking about this tremendously important topic. And I wanted very much to not only deal with medicine, of which I am a member of the medical class, but also to deal with socioeconomic, political, and even cultural aspects of what it means to grow old in America and beyond and to address certain paradoxes, most common of which is, can we afford old age? And I will return to that. And also to deal with a great deal of misinformation, because there is a lot of misinformation about aging. And to deal with some of the specific challenges, such as Social Security and Medicare, and to compose a kind of agenda for action for all of us, because we're going to get older, and we have to be prepared, better prepared than we are today. So most of you know that in the 20th century, we gained a staggering additional 30 years of life. I've said that so many times, but I still find it mind-boggling. For example, in 1776, the beginning of our great country, the average life expectancy was only 35, and only 2% of the population was over 65. By 1900, the average life expectancy had moved up to 47, but only 3 plus percent of the population over 65. Now, 100 years later, the average life expectancy, collecting both men and women, is 77 and over 12% of the population. But as pointed out in Warren County, it's even more remarkable. There's a great advantage to women who used to die terribly from childbirth. So in this century, the 20th century, the last century, we began to move up for an advantage for women now about 5.4 years. And it's not only the fact that people are living longer, but more healthily, because we've had a decline in disability rates. We don't want to just live long if we're disabled. So the quality of life has increased. Now we know, of course, that a lot of that additional life expectancy, 30 years in a century, is a consequence of the remarkable reductions of childhood and infant mortality rates. But it's very important to know that from age 65, there's also been an increase in longevity. And about 17% of that 30-year gain has been from age 65. The concerns are, can we afford old people? Well, the fact of the aging of populations result in economic stagnation. Will there be intergenerational conflicts? Can we deal with chronic illness, which is abundant, especially, unfortunately, with the rapid gain of weight and obesity in America? We are now, sadly, the, health, the heaviest nation in the world. And then the worry about entitlements, that is Social Security and Medicare, and the continuing occasion of prejudice with respect to age, which we're seeing now, by the way, with those older persons who feel they can't retire because of the economic duress but are finding it very hard to hold on to their jobs or to get new ones. Next. There's a great deal of denial because it's frightening, really, to think about old age all the time. And I've never counseled that we should be morbidly preoccupied by growing older. But it obviously does make some sense to consider your own future and to be prepared for it. So we have to get over our denial, and we have to get the attention of policymakers and politicians. So that's been tough. There are no Claude Peppers in Congress today, unfortunately, if you remember Claude Pepper, the great figure in the 1960s who did such a remarkable job as an advocate for older people within Congress. And we haven't reached the tipping point. That is, all of us in this room understand the importance of 